Well, good afternoon, CMX. It is such a joy to be here with you. We are going to get a little serious for a few minutes, but I promise we'll end on a high note this afternoon. And um, in case you can't tell, I think I was entirely over-caffeinated when I came up with this title today. But we are really going to talk about trust and what it means to have trust within a community and how we make that happen. So in case you didn't realize, we are in a trust crisis. The 2021 Edelman Trust Barometer measured trust in government, media, NGOs, and businesses around the world. And across the board, they found that trust in all of these entities notably declined. In fact, the Edelman Trust Barometer's theme for 2021 was declaring information bankruptcy. It's easy to blame the current state of just about everything on the pandemic, political instability, climate change, you name it. But the reality is the current trust crisis has been brewing for years. In 2016, PwC did a global survey of CEOs and 55% of CEOs in 2016 believed that lack of trust was a threat to their organization. So you better believe that number is probably much, much higher today. So this is an ongoing real problem with real implications for organizations and businesses of all sizes. And of course, for community leaders and community professionals, this trend is particularly worrisome. After all, trust is an essential element of any high value, high functioning community. So um, as, as I was introduced in my daily role, I work for a global hospitality company. And here's the thing, when you walk into any one of our thousand hotels around the world, the team members who greet you, serve you, take care of you while you're at that hotel, in most cases, are not our employees. They're actually our franchisees' employees. So I spend a lot of my time every day thinking about how do we build community with this incredible group of global hospitality professionals, and how do we continue to build trust with this group after everything that has happened in the pandemic. So it's a big part of my daily job. But the community I'm here to talk about today is actually a passion project that kind of sits outside of my daily responsibilities. We've already established that I worked in hospitality, so I went through a number of unexpected career changes over the last three years. And I know I'm probably not alone here, so if you have had an unexpected career path change or job change in the last three years, raise your hand, yeah? And keep your hand up if you've had more than one change in the last three years. So yeah, all the same people, right? So first of all, give yourselves a round of applause for managing to thrive in such a challenging time and challenging environment. After all, that's our theme this week, right? Thriving. Um, and for me, I was really fortunate that with each unexpected change, it actually brought me a lot more opportunities and growth and better compensation. Um, and in retrospect, this was only possible because I had a great network of female peers. And these were women who sponsored me for jobs, referred me for jobs, and were just great, great at giving me advice, great at advocating on my behalf. Um, and of course, there's an off-sided statistic 85% of roles are filled through personal referrals. So of course, it's not what you know, it's who you know. So I think you know the power of a great professional network has never been more clear, never been more relevant. And for me, the other factor at play during all of that career change during the pandemic was it really forced me to be a lot more honest with people and to really talk about what I needed, what I wanted, to get real with myself about what I needed and what I wanted in a way that I probably wouldn't have done before the pandemic. And it forced me to trust other people. So, of course, networking, very strong. And because of all of that, I decided to start an all-female networking group. And I know, I know, you probably heard the word networking and you're probably cringing, um, especially if you've been to a typical networking function before. Um, in fact, when you Google networking, these are a couple of the terrifying images that come up. So you've got people in matching suits for no reason, inexplicably. Um, we've got a couple who, I think they're on a date, but this guy is their third wheel. I don't know about you, those are like not any situations I ever want to be in. Um, and of course, this is what we think of when we think about networking. Um, and we all know what that's like. 
our event tonight will not be anything like that, right? Because we know how to have a good time and there's a lot of trust in this community. But if you've been to a typical networking event, maybe it's in an oversized hotel ballroom, maybe it's on an academic campus, uh, there might be a keynote speaker, there might be some lukewarm coffee, maybe some barely passable wine. Um, and you know, people just stand around and make small talk. And if you're an introvert, it's really painful, right? You're just, you're just happy if you find somebody you know who offers a place of safe refuge. Um, and the real reason these things suck is because nobody trusts each other. Nobody is willing to be candid. Nobody's willing to speak up. Nobody wants to be too vulnerable and ask for what they're looking for. Um, and, you know, except for maybe a couple of our friends in sales, so shout out to our extroverts, good for them, but for the rest of us, it's not a great experience. And of course, the lack of trust is what really makes these events so painful. And this is the classic networking advice we get. You probably all heard this before. Make small talk, how boring. Uh, stick to safe topics. There are no safe topics in 2022. I think we can all agree about that. Um, and don't ask for anything. Uh, he heaven forbid you actually try to get something done at this event. Um, and so this is the other reason those networking events just suck. Um, with advice like this, it's really amazing we get anything done ever. Um, and of course, you've seen this all over LinkedIn probably, this type of advice, and from hundreds of career coaches on Instagram hawking this advice. And guess what? It doesn't work. On the other hand, what might it look like if a community created radical trust within its members and they freely shared their deepest dreams and lifted each other up? Okay, now that is a community I wanna be a part of. That is a networking group that I wanna be a part of. So when it came to creating a female-based networking group, I knew that trust really needed to be at the center of it. So one night, while I was killing time at an airport bar, as you do, especially given the delays in our world today, you could be at that bar for hours. Uh, you can get a lot of work done. Um, so one night while I was at an airport bar, I started the Ask Method. And the Ask Method is an inclusive community of women who are not afraid to ask for what we need, want, and deserve. Society doesn't encourage women to openly speak about our goals, or to be overly ambitious, or to speak up when we need help. Ask encourages women to be vocal about their goals and unapologetically ambitious. No ask is too big or too small for this group. And in speaking our needs, we harness our collective power and manifest a better tomorrow. So this community started in 2021, and it includes a social media presence as well as some digital content and in-person events probably a combination we're all pretty used to. Um, and in just a few short months, we helped multiple women find new jobs. We helped women negotiate over half a million dollars in additional annual compensation. And we helped women launch and grow their businesses and nonprofits. And these are just a few things that women in our community say about it. It quickly opened up opportunities I didn't even know were an option. I received an introduction that changed the course of my business. And as a Southerner, my personal favorite, I was never in a sorority, but this is my sorority now. So these results came from a group of women who largely did not know each other at all prior to joining the group, prior to joining the community. And so achieving this type of outcome meant that we needed to develop the trust within that group very quickly and also to encourage vulnerability. So let's get down to the science of trust. A ton of thought leaders from Simon Sinek to Brene Brown have spoken about this. So I won't bore you guys with the nitty gritty science details this afternoon. You can just take my word for it. But the bottom line is that oxytocin increases our ability to trust others. So I knew that to quickly create trust within my community, I needed to focus on things that would create that oxytocin and enable a thoughtful, trusting, supportive community. I focused on three things that are foundational factors to create those feel-good chemicals and build trust. 
So earlier, Katie had four S's, we've got three F's, so we're just going through the alphabet this afternoon. Uh, but the first factor is framework. Provide a structure that's easy to understand and provides a roadmap to your members. The second factor, which I think is really at the core of any community and also at the human experience as social creatures, is to facilitate connections. It's not just enough to enable people to meet each other, you've got to enable them to find common ground and common ground that's going to be mutually beneficial. And lastly, I focused on fellowship. So fellowship is more than just spending time together. The intentionality of the time spent together is what makes it meaningful and what turns something from a meeting into fellowship. So hopefully you've all had a chance to read Priya Parker's book because her, heart, her work is really at the heart of that, right? How do we bring more meaning into our interactions and how do we be more intentional about that? So let's talk about framework. When we provide a clear framework, it's easier and less intimidating for community members, especially new community members, to start interacting with the group. So in the case of Ask, we begin each session by having each woman introduce herself. And I'm not talking about a regular introduction. I'm talking about like a, you know, SmackDown wrestling match introduction. I want you to be so proud of yourself when you introduce yourself and to tell me all the things you're passionate about, not just your nine to five, but your side hustles, the nonprofits you support, all the things that you're so proud of. Because we know as women, we don't get enough opportunities to do that. And then the second thing we do is after her introduction, every woman has to make a specific ask of the group. This framework helps women quickly connect with the larger group, and it provides the basis for future conversations with other members in the group. Um, and because of the sensitive nature of some ask, and because we really want to encourage people to be as honest and as explicit as possible, we also remind members of our privacy standards and our privacy expectations at each event. So that helps everyone feel a lot more comfortable in making certain requests. And here are just a few of the things that women ask for during our last session. So you've got everything from referrals, nonprofit donors, clients, ideas, introductions, employees. We have had women hire each other on the spot. Um, and we even had one woman who was launching a new website. She was looking for beta testers. So again, no ask too big, no ask too small. And because of the sense of trust within the group, of course, a lot of these asks are fulfilled in real time. And these are things that would normally take women weeks, months, years to accomplish. So it's a really good use of time. Giving people a framework helps create an even playing field. It sets expectations and creates and sets the stage for meaningful conversations. Allowing everyone the same opportunity, regardless of whether they're an introvert or an extrovert, whether they're just starting their career or they're at the peak of their career, whether they're an empty nester or a new mom. And I've seen this professionally as well. In the wake of the pandemic, you can imagine implementing um, you know, incredibly time-consuming training or service standards is not the reality for most hotel teams. We are facing these same labor shortages that almost every industry in the globe is dealing with right now. So we focused on providing a simple framework for our team members, focused on having them pivot some of the everyday questions, right? Are you checking in? How are you? Into more open-ended, more thoughtful questions. That's it, that's all we're asking them to do. It's easy, it's clear, it doesn't take them a lot of time, there's not a lot of training involved, right? We can teach anybody how to do that. And the teams that practice that and put that into play foster a greater sense of trust and community, not just with guests, but within their own team. They also have better problem resolution and better service scores. So we love that. So how could framework apply to your community? Let's be clear, framework is a lot more than governance or your community standards or your code of conduct. Those are all foundations, right? And in a lot of sense, they're kind of a CYA. So if you're managing a digital community, a large digital community, what this framework might look like is providing clear instructions or clear conversation prompts um, or creating a standardized but meaningful way for new members to introduce themselves and engage with the group. And the important thing about framework 
is the trust that it creates. Also stems from a sense of equality. A sense that everyone, regardless of role, tenure, or status, is participating in the group in the same way, bringing the same thing to the table. So, of course, modeling the framework, participating in the framework, is by definition critical for any community manager. Professionally, I've worked with some brands um, where I've seen brand leaders who did not model their own brand framework within, them, within their stakeholder communities. And I can tell you one of two things happens. So either leadership becomes out of touch with that stakeholder community, and all the time, money, and resources that were invested in developing that community are essentially wasted. Or, even worse, the community becomes toxic and does little to serve the brand or its community members and is also a waste of time and money. So the lesson here is talk the talk. You better believe that anytime I host an ask session for our group, I'm coming with a real, meaningful, vulnerable ask of my own. And I'm modeling that transparency and the trust that I expect from our members as well. Our second factor for building trust is facilitating connections. Within the ask community, it's my responsibility to take note of each woman's background and experience so that I can help facilitate those connections between members. And this is a role I take really seriously. Before each event, I usually spend an hour, sometimes more, reviewing each member's profile so that I can really help make those meaningful connections. And of course, this is one of the biggest values you can provide to your community. And I also proactively invite women to join Ask. Oftentimes, women I've never even met in public or, or in person. Um, and this is also something our members take a lot of pride in. In fact, right now, two of our members are having a little bit of a competition, a little bit of a bet to see who can bring the most women to the next event. And of course, a refrain we hear often is, how do we make big small? Or how do we take a event like we're all at today and make it feel more intimate? How do you make a large digital community easy to navigate? With an in-person community, sometimes this is more straightforward and you can rely on a couple of meaningful in-person introductions to kind of help get this done. For other communities, a peer-to-peer -peer or member-to-member -member mentoring or partnership program can help make big small. And hopefully you've all met Christina Garnett before. Um, she's a great CMXer. Um, but she will tell you advocacy programs can also help facilitate these connections and really empower our community members. Making the big small builds trust and it ultimately strengthens your community. After all, we all have an innate need to feel that we belong, that we matter, and that we value. And all of that contributes to that virtuous oxytocin trust cycle. As our in-person sessions have grown for Ask, I've learned this the hard way. When the group gets too big, it becomes really difficult to facilitate a single meaningful conversation. But setting a limit uh, on the size of any event or session really felt counterintuitive to our value of inclusivity. So now what we've realized is that any given month, if an event is going to be more than 18 people at any point in time, we split that into two groups. So for the first part of the evening, those groups actually each have their own ask sessions. Everyone gets that meaningful, intentional conversation. Um, and then the groups come back together for a little bit more of a traditional mixing and mingling. So everyone still also has the opportunity to meet each other. And of course, the last component of building trust within your community is fellowship. There are so many studies that show that couples that engage in novel or new tasks or activities have stronger relationships. And of course, that's why so many corporate team building events include a ropes course or a karaoke night. Because when we get out of our comfort zone, it necessitates that we're coming from a place of trust. And a big part of the fellowship within Ask is sharing and celebrating each member's achievements and successes. If you're looking for a personal hype woman, this is the group. These women are relentless, yet thoughtful supporters and cheerleaders for each other. And co-creation has also been a big part of the fellowship within this community. 
Um, one member suggested that we launch a community newsletter, and I was initially hesitant about that because, frankly, I don't have the time to take that on. But she wanted to take it on. She wanted to own it. And another member volunteered and offered to own it as well. And so working in partnership with them has been extremely rewarding. And likewise, another member texted me one day and she said, hey, do you know a good headshot photographer? She was starting a new role. She was really excited about it. She's in sales. Um, and she wanted a headshot that really reflected where she's at in her career today. And I had an inkling, especially if you've been on LinkedIn a little bit, that other people might also want some new headshots. So sure enough, I was right. Um, we had a ton of women take us up on that. So now we actually host quarterly headshot photo sessions, um, and all of our proceeds go to our local Girls Inc. chapter. Um, so that has also created a sense of fellowship and trust because our community is coming together to help support the larger community and a cause that's really close to our hearts. So fellowship can take a variety of forms, including working side by side, of course, like volunteering or connecting virtually. And if you're running a professional group, this could even look like bringing some people together to work on something like a white paper or a project that's meaningful for them. And in today's world, regardless of your community's core focus and purpose, there's no shortage of needs and global causes that could align with your community. And the good news is, if you're not already doing this, you don't have to worry because you can just ask your community and I promise they will tell you about the causes and the needs that are close to their hearts. So David Armistad, who's a consultant and a community builder, once said, trust each other again and again and again. When the trust level gets high enough, people transcend apparent limits, discovering new and awesome abilities of which they were previously unaware. So as we wrap up this afternoon, in keeping with the philosophy of the ask method, I have an ask to make of all of you. Take a minute to take, take, a, minute to take a step back and think about how you could build framework, facilitate connections, and fellowship to create a deeper sense of trust within your community. And in doing so, I hope your communities transcend those limits and discover new and awesome abilities. So that is our formal, uh, formal presentation today, but we have plenty of time for Q&A, again, in keeping with our Ask Method philosophy. So if there are any questions you have, um, we would love for you to ask them. And if not, I will be around for the rest of the day. Oh, yes. How did you get people involved initially? Did you reach out to some women that you knew that you thought would be interested, or did you just like take it? I did. Um, and it, it really, so I will be very honest with you. Um, I am 50-50. I'm half extrovert, half introvert. So this is a little bit outside of my comfort zone. So I was actually part of a recipe club that started in the pandemic, of all things. Um, but it was a pretty tight group of women. Um, so I started with them. And then from there, started looking at our top 40 under 40 list. I live in Memphis, Tennessee. So um, we're a population about a million in the metro area. So we're a decent sized city, but still kind of manageable. Um, I started reaching out to women I did not even know, but that I knew made a huge impact on our community. And you would be so surprised how many people will actually respond to something like that in a positive way and say, this is something I've been looking for. Um, because maybe I am a part of some other women's groups or some other networking groups, but they're not actually fulfilling my need or they're not fulfilling this specific need. Um, so yeah, I had to get a little bit out of my comfort zone um, in building that. And then from there, of course, it was really organic. Um, we've had a lot of members invite clients, sisters, neighbors, coworkers. And again, like I said, I've got two members who they are in a like fight. They're both coaches. So right, like they're kind of naturally competitive um, to see who can bring the most women into the group. Yeah. I have some questions around fellowship. Um, I'd love you to dive into it two different ways. So one, if you're primarily thinking about your digital community, how do you create fellowship there when it's more digital and you're over a thousand members? And then how often do you think you need to come together live to create real fellowship? So I think that kind of changes depending on the geography and the size of the group. 
So professionally, um, I have, of course, hundreds of thousands of people that I'm uh, responsible for. So for us, we'll even do things like we did, um, you can make custom wordles. So we've done things like that that were kind of just fun, one-off things, but people got very into them. Um, and we used Microsoft Teams, and the Teams chat was lit for like a solid week with people doing the custom wordles. So I think you can find kind of fun things like that to bring some of that kind of novelty in, um, but then also facilitating, even if it's you know via chat or posting in a forum, facilitating some of those meaningful conversations and prompts. So one of the brands that I work on, um, the one that we, we really focus on these open-ended questions, we will post those very, sometimes very personal questions in our community and our team members respond. Um, and the level of vulnerability that they bring into that space is absolutely incredible. And it also allows them to really kind of connect with each other um, and remind them that even though they're not our employees, we really care about their well-being. And then in thinking about, okay, so how often should you be coming back in person? Um, for the ask method, we meet monthly, typically actually in October, we'll meet twice because we heard from a lot of women, especially women with young children, that they were looking for a weekend session. So we'll do our first weekend session and see how that goes. Um, for larger groups, especially again, if they're kind of those big geographic differences, I think annually, you've got to make a big deal of it, right? You've got to really hype it up and get people excited. It's got to be something they look forward to. But I think annually is still, can be really meaningful and impactful and something that members will value. Yeah, Carolyn. Wait for the microphone so I don't have to shout. Um, about when you were pitching people you didn't even know, how did you go about describing the value of the ASK community before it existed um, without being necessarily disparaging of existing things. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a similar community that serves creatives, and there are groups that serve creatives in our area, but they don't do it the way we do. So how did you verbalize that, I guess? That is such a good question about how do you grow your community without disparaging other communities. Um, so for us, actually, a lot of the women who are most active in our group run other women's professional groups. So I have immediately created allies with them to avoid that um, because I do think we're stronger when we come together and when we collaborate in meaningful ways. Um, I am not a PR professional. I've tried my hand at that, so I can't say that my pitching skills are incredible. Um, but usually I just speak to the woman um, in the most meaningful way possible. And sharing my story, I think, a lot can be very impactful. And, of course, sometimes other people look at me and they're like, are you? crazy, like what are you talking about? And then they come to an event and they're like, oh, I get it. Um, and, and, and particularly once they start following us on social and kind of seeing some of the things that women are asking for, what some of the, that dynamic looks like, and for lack of a better word, fellowship or sisterhood, right, that dynamic, it's something they really want to be a part of. Um, but certainly our goal um, is to differentiate ourselves without disparaging any of the existing communities. In fact, um, Memphis has a great group called City Leadership that's very influential in town, and they hosted our session for July at their incredible space. Um, so we have tried to build community partnerships wherever possible. Yeah. One more question. You mentioned that you split into two groups when it gets bigger than 18. How did you figure out that 18 was the magic number of you know, keeping it conversational and not too big, making yeah. big small? So um, and thinking about kind of the numbers of the group, right? How do you determine when your group's getting too big and maybe you need to divide it up? Uh, Priya Parker, her book actually has some great context on that. Um, but also we just, we hit kind of like 25 or 30 people one night. And that was when you could really feel it was very hard to moderate and facilitate that conversation because there starts to be a lot of side conversations, especially since we don't do like a formal presentation or setting or a keynote speaker like some networking events do. We are about that sense of equality, but that can kind of get a little out of hand. But we had hosted smaller events in the past that were kind of eight, nine, 10 people. And the dynamic and the conversation there was really different because each person has a little bit more time. So in addition to kind of going around the room and making those asks, women would actually start to like workshop 
those needs in real time. They would be whipping out their phones, making connections on LinkedIn, following somebody on social media, sending an email to somebody else, asking for somebody's resume. They would be doing all of those things. So it, it, it really takes a little bit of trial and error, but I think for a lot of groups that probably is the general ratio, right? Once you get up to 20 people, if you're gonna have a kind of facilitated single conversation, you're gonna start to feel some of that tension. Um, and it also meant that I had to you know, trust somebody else to help facilitate the second group. And I was really lucky that we had a great community member, you know, who's like our, a super user, a power user, um, and was super excited about taking that on. Um, she was new to town. She moved to town during the pandemic. Um, and so this group has been, you know, kind of her core community, and she's really passionate about it. So I was thankful to have somebody um, that I could have, you know, facilitate that second conversation. And I think that's all the more reason to start, you know, developing your super users, finding those advocates, so that even if you're not at the point yet where you need to do that, when the day comes, because it will come, and sometimes it will come unexpectedly, you can quickly turn to somebody and tag them in to help you. Thank you very much. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.